Chapter 6 Port O Porno The pirate port of Porno is, of course, dead now, replaced by the clean lawfulness of online sex. No, replaced by the clean lawfulness of Port Midway. But a hundred years ago, in the days before the patrol ships came, she roared her bawdy song through the farthest reaches of the solar system. For crack merchant ships and dingy space-trading tramps alike, she was haven. Drink and drugs, women and diversions unspeakable, lured to her spaceports the cream and scum, adventurers and riffraff of half a dozen worlds. Sailors and pirates paid off at her and stayed as long as their wages lasted in the street of sailors. Not a few remained permanently, their bodies flung to the beasts of the savage jungle that rimmed the port. There only the cunning and strong could live. Ray guns were the surest law. Modern scientific progress stood side by side with murderous lawlessness as old as man himself. The hell town had grown with the strides of a giant, rising rapidly from a muddy street of Teo shacks to a small cosmetropolis. She was essentially a place of contrasts. Two of the big Earth companies had modern spaceship hangars there, well-lighted, well-equipped, but under their very noses was a festering welter of dark, rutted byways, extending all the way to the comparative orderliness of the short, narrow street of the merchants, itself flanked by the drunken bedlam of the street of the sailors. It can be understood why these men who flew, who needed a whole solar system for elbow room, disdained setting to order the measly few acres of dirt they stopped at. But it is a mystery why, when used to living through vast leagues of space, they endured such narrow streets and cluttered houses. Probably tired from their long, cramped cruises, impatient for their fling, they just didn't care a whoop. The whole jumble that was this famous spaceport rested in the heart of Satellite Three's primeval jungle. Tall, electric-wired fences girdled Port Oporno to keep the jungle back. It was equivalent to a death sentence to pass unarmed outside them. The monstrous shapes that lived and fought in the jungle's swampy gloom saw to that. Hideous nightmare shapes they were, some reptilian and comparable only to the giants that roamed Earth in her prehistoric ages. Eating, fighting, breeding in the humid gloominess of the vegetation-shrouded swamps, their bellows and roars sometimes at night thundered right through porno, a reminder of nature yet untamed. Occasionally, in the berserk ecstasy of the mating season, they hurled their house-high bodies at the guarding fences, and then there was panic in the town, and many lives ripped out before a barrage of rays drove the monsters back. They were not the only inhabitants native to Satellite 3. Deep underground, seldom seen by men, lived a race of man-mole creatures half-human in intelligence, blind from their unlit habitat, but larger than a man and stronger. Fiercer, too, when cornered. Their numbers no one knew, but their bored tunnels, it had been found, constituted a lower layer of life over the whole satellite. Probably more vicious than these native threes of porno were the visiting bipeds, man himself, who thronged the cantrans, which may be defined as dives for the purveying of all entertainments. In them were a score of snares for the buccaneer with money in his pocket and dope in his blood. The open doors on the street of the sailors were all loudspeakers of drunken oaths and laughter, pierced now and then by a scream or cry, as someone in the sweating press of bodies inside knew rage or fear. 
One interplanetarily notorious cantran made a feature of swinging its attractions aloft in gilded cages, where all of them, young and old, pale and painted, giant and dwarf, ogled the arrested passers-by and invited sampling of their wares. Of all kinds and conditions of men were these passers-by. Earthling sailors, white, negro, Chinese, and Eurasian, most of them in the drab blue of spaceship crews, but each with a ray gun strapped to his waist. Short, thin-faced Venusians, shifty-eyed, cunning, with the planet's universal weapon, the skewer blade, sheathed at their sides. Tall, sweaty Martians, powerful brutes, wearing the air-rarifying mask that was necessary for them in Satellite Three's Earth-like atmosphere. Businessmen and sightseers, except the most bold, were apt to stay in their houses after their first visit to the Street of the Sailors. Each face on the street or in the cantrans that lined it bore the mark of drink, or the contemptuous, insolent expression bred by porno's favorite drug, Isuan. Around porno was the constant threat of savage life. Below it were half-human savagery and mystery. Above, in the very shadow of their mighty engines of space, were the most vicious animals of all, degraded men. This was the Port O'Porno of a hundred years ago. This was the Port O'Porno where master scientist Elliot Lethgow, for very good reasons, had told Hawk Kars he would meet him. 574, the house of his friend. Night descended suddenly on the outlaw spaceport that day. The elderly exile waited in vain for his comrade-in-arms, Hawk Kars, to show up. There were six hours when the blasting heat received by Satellite 3 from near-lying Jupiter would be gone, and in its place a warm, cloying tropical darkness, heavy with the odors of town and exotic products and the damp, lush vegetation of the impinging jungle. The night would be given over to carousing. For these six hours, the street of the sailors came to life. It was a time to keep strictly in hiding. In the middle of that night, when the pleasures of porno were in full stride, <laughs> I thought I was getting over it. When the pleasures of porno were in full stride, there emerged suddenly from one of the dark, crooked byways that angled off the street of the sailors, a squad of five men whose disciplined pace and regular formation were in marked contrast to the confusion around them. They were slant-eyed men with smooth saffron faces and strongly built, and they were armed, each one, with both a ray gun and a two-foot black-pointed tube. But it was not their numbers, formation, or weapons that caused the carousing crowd to fall silent and hastily get out of their path. It was, rather, the insignia embroidered on the breasts of the gray smocks they wore. The insignia represented an asteroid in a circle of the ten planets, and the street of sailors knew that sign and dreaded it. The squad pressed along rapidly. A still comely woman, new to porno, plucked, smirking at the leader's sleeve, but his pace did not slacken, and she fell back, puzzled and afraid because of her feeling of something lifeless, dumb, machine-like in the man. Ahead, an Iswan-maddened earthling fell foul of a Venusian. A circle cleared in the mob, a Reagan spat and missed and the Venusian closed, the gleam of a skewer blade playing around him. This was combat, this was interesting, but none of the squad's five men gave the fight a glance, or even turned his head when, as they passed, the butchered earthling coughed out his life. So they passed, and soon they were gone down another black-throated byway. 
They padded noiselessly along in the darkness to turn again presently, pausing finally before a low, steel-walled house, typical of the strongholds of prudent merchants of the port. No lights were visible within it. All seemed asleep. Silence filled the narrow street and unrelieved darkness. Occasionally, a desultory breeze brought sounds of a burst of revelry from the street of the sailors. Once, the ports of an outbound spaceship flashed overhead for an instant. But there was mainly silence and darkness, and in it the five men parleying close together in toneless whispers. After a little, they separated. On Cat's feet, four of them stole around the sides of the house. The fifth, drawing the black pointed tube from his sash, crept up to the front entrance port and held the tip to it. Blue lights sparkled fantastically, revealing his impassive face, outlining his crouching body. Then, quite suddenly, the port appeared to melt inward, and he disappeared into the blackness of the interior. Presently there came a stir of movement, a whisper, a rustle from inside, a challenge, shouts volleying forth, a scream, another, and the peculiar rattling sound that comes from a dying man's throat. Then again, silence. Five shadows melted from the front entrance port. They were carrying something black and still and heavy between them. The errand was done.